cool. Um, feels weird being thanked before I've done anything. You might want to be careful. You might not want to thank you for my list is done. Okay, so yeah, regardless, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, letting me come here and give these lectures. Uh, so I'm just going to get started right away. Uh, so the first thing that I'd like to talk about is the algebra of disks. And so many of you may have seen this before, many of you might not have. I'm going to go nice and slow. So I want to contemplate the following category. Uh, I'm going to call this category disk1, comma, OR. OR stands for the word origin. This is a category whose objects are oriented one dimensional disks and disjoint unions thereof. So let me be specific, you can actually enumerate uh, these category or these objects. There's an object called the empty disjoint union. No manifold at all, or the most important manifold of all time, depending on your perspective. Um, when I say disk, I mean open disks. So, for instance, the real line with its standard orientation, which I might draw like so, is an object. That object, disjoint union with itself, is an object. And in general, our disjoint union of maybe k times is an object. Okay? And it's a finite disjoint union. The objects can be enumerated as such. And what are the morphisms? Um, morphism. So let's say that I have some k disjoint unions of oriented lines and l disjoint unions of oriented lines. This is respecting orientation. And by the way, my philosophy in, in always lecturing is to introduce one new idea at a time. For all of you wondering about do you put a topology on this, etc. I'm not going to address this point until later, and the experts among you will see why. And uh, composition is the usual thing. You just compose embeddings, and embeddings are closed under composition. Clearly, there's the identity embedding of a manifold to itself. This is a category. Okay. So I don't just want to consider this category. I also want to consider certain functors out of it. So I'm going to consider functors from the category of one-dimensional oriented disks to the category of vector spaces over some fixed base field K. And again, it's kind of crazy that we're in a math culture where I need to say this. I really mean the category of vector spaces over K. There's no chain complexes or anything. If that comment makes no sense to you, ignore it. Uh, for the moment, I'll allow infinite dimensional ones. Yeah, so if you're set theoretically inclined, we should fix some you know, strongly inaccessible cardinal, and I'll look at vector spaces whose underlying set uh, has cardinality less than that. But most of you probably don't care about those details. Vector spaces as reasonably big as you want. Okay, but I don't want to look at all functors. Um, I want to notice, actually, that this category of disks has an operation on it called disjoint union. Given two objects, I can take their disjoint union, Given a collection of embeddings from a collection of objects, I can take the disjoint union of all of them. Which is to say, this has a symmetric monoidal structure called disjoint union. That's what this notation is. About. So there's a symmetric monoidal structure. And of course, the category of vector spaces admits such a thing. In fact, it admits many such things. But there's one that probably all of us know and love, or depending on our profession, hate. Um, we can tensor product vector spaces over here. So I want to consider functors that respect this. So I want to consider functors that I'll call capital F, um, such that the following conditions are satisfied. So first, um, S, I'll say respects this joint union and tensor product, which is to say that they're natural isomorphisms. So I apply F to two objects the disjoint union of them is supplied a natural isomorphism from whatever the functor assigns tensor. So 
just as an example, if I take a real line and I distribute meaning at k times, this will just be whatever I assign to the real line tensors with itself k times. I'm being careful with my sponsor k. And so just by definition, let me just set whatever I assign to the real line, let me just denote it by capital A. Okay. Uh, and note in particular that actually f of the empty set, an empty manifold, has to be sent to the unit of the symmetric monoidal structure, which is the base of the empty. Okay. And I want this function to satisfy uh, one more condition, which is that uh, isotopic embeddings are sent to the same map. I don't need to explain what an isotopy is. It's a homotopy of embeddings where at every single time t, that homotope map is still an embedding. It's a movie of embedding. And so isotopic embeddings are sent to the same map. So let me just give you an example of why this kind of thing might be useful. So let's consider the set of all embeddings to mark to itself uh, that respect orientation. So here's my copy of the real line. You can imagine that the image of this embedding might actually even be bounded. But of course, up to isotopy, uh, because any orientation preserving map is going to be an increasing function from the domain to the codomain, I can isotope through increasing functions. And this is just some image of some embedding J. I can isotope so that J becomes the identity map of R. So in fact, what this condition of sending isotopic embeddings being sent to the same map implies is that for any oriented uh, embedding from R to R, this is always sent the identity map from whatever the vector space A is to the vector space A. Okay, so this simplifies a lot of things. Why am I wasting your time talking about one-dimensional manifolds that happen to be visual meanings of real lines? Here's a theorem. Um, the data of such a functor F is the same thing as the data of a unital associative algebra over K. So it's not an accident that I chose the notation capital A. Um, so again, in case this is the first time that you've seen this, let me sketch a proof of this fact. Um, I wrote way too big. <laughs> I'm later gonna want to modify these definitions. So just a sketch of why this is true. Or maybe I'm not writing too big. Just let me know if I write too small and you can't read something. Okay, so here's a sketch of how this works. So I made sure to use the word unital. What's the unit? Well, there's a unique embedding from the empty set to the real line. So this will get sent to some function that I'll call lowercase u from the base field to A. Uh, we discussed how the map from R to R is always sent to the identity. So let's try to understand embeddings from R between R to R. Here's a little cartoon of what's happening. Let me label my real lines 1 and 2. I can embed 1 and 2 like so. So that's certainly a picture of an embedding. There's another interesting embedding, however, which is I can apply a twist to the domain. and I get two different embeddings of this object into my target set. Evidently, these two embeddings are definitely not isotopic. Right? There's no way that I can move these intervals past each other through an isotope. Okay, so we get two different maps, and I'll just call, um, you know, I'm calling every embedding J, for which I apologize. So I have an embedding called J, and I have an embedding called J pre-composed with a swap map. Okay? So this will be sent to two different maps, from A tensor A, a on my symmetric monoidal condition. So J is going to be sent to some map that I'll call M. And whatever this other map is, by the symmetric monoidal condition, I know that it's the swap map and then M. Okay. Cool. We're here now, the swap map is the map that exchanges the two variables of the tensor set. I'm abusing notation. Okay. 
So evidently you see a unit map, you see a multiplication map, and now I need to verify the properties of that being a unit and this multiplication being a first map. Okay, you guys have a preference? Okay, so let's verify that it's a unit. So to verify that it's a unit, so let me just call this uh, J empty. I can look at the map called J empty disjoint union the identity of R, and I can multiply. Oops, I call this J. I call it J sub M. And I need to verify that uh, this is in fact somehow equivalent to the identity map. Okay, so if you just draw a picture of what this looks like, it's this picture where I've just deleted the first interval. And so they don't equal, this diagram doesn't commute on the nodes, so there's an isotope here. Making this diagram commute. So it's the embedding called number two, and I just isotope it to the identity as I did earlier. Okay. Um, now my bad board work is kicking me in the butt. So now let me apply the functor f to this, and I get that k tensors with a, mapping to the unit map tensors with the identity map. J tensor A, and I have this multiplication map. And so because this composite embedding commutes up to isotopy with the identity, by the definition that isotopic maps get sent to the same linear map, the linear map called this composite is sent exactly to this linear map called the identity. Okay? So this verifies unitality. And now let me verify associativity. This is already Fun exercise in board work. Mm -hmm. Okay, I told you you shouldn't thank me so early. All right. Um, so now let's just look at different ways that I can embed three real lines into a single one. This is like yoga. Okay. And so you know, there's something silly you can do, which is that when you have three intervals, uh, and you just want to include it into a single one, you could try first carrying two intervals together, ignoring what you do to the third interval. So this is Jn, this should union the identity on the third component. And then you can include these together. So just to be pedantic, I'm taking this bracketed copy of the real line and I'm embedding it like this and so the composite looks like this. Of course I could have done the identity and then JM and then JM. And evidently the composite is just embedding the three intervals into the real line. The ordering is respected and so they're isotopic. And so this commutes up to isotopy. <coughs> this completes the proof more or less. For this into the functor F just into the usual commutative diagram that you draw when you want to define a multiplication as being associated. Are there any questions about this proof? This is some of the most fundamental facts that we'll be using over and over again. Yeah. Uh, so do we require in the data of the function that uh, the swap is done to this particular? Yes, exactly. Uh, right. So I put respects in quotes. Uh -huh. And so I wrote like there exists natural isomorphisms on the board. What I said in words is you are supplied with natural isomorphisms like this. And part of the data, the natural isomorphisms that I didn't write on the board, is that you should have swap maps. In fact, the most mathematically precise way to say this is f is a symmetric monoidal functor. And by definition, a symmetric monoidal functor comes equipped with the data of the swap maps as you demand. So I hit that terminology again in case somebody in this room hadn't seen this definition before. That's exactly what we're asking for. But it's not important for this. It is important for this theorem because you need to be able to say that the swap map of the real lines here, which is specified by the symmetric monoidal structure, is the swap map to this. Um, one reason is, so you might notice that in this proof, uh, I never used the swap of JM. This shows that JM is an associative multiplication. But of course, if you look at this, it looks like I'm actually supplied with two multiplications called M precomposed with swap. Uh, and that would be a horrible injustice if, well, I want this theorem to be true. So I'm not given two different associative algebra structures. Swap map just applies the opposite multiplication by swapping. Okay. 
Any other questions? Maybe too basic. Um, so now, um, I have to come clean to you. I don't normally just work with these kinds of simple-minded categories. Uh, I like having homotopy. Let me try to motivate why involving something like homotopy in this picture might be useful. Okay. Um, so here's a natural question you can ask. Can we extend f to be a functor out of, say, not just one dimensional disk, but one dimensional manifold? Okay. Why might you want such a thing? Well, a perverse way to look at this is that this functor gives you an invariant of the real line called capital A. It's an invariant that respects sister and union and that ascends sister and union to the problem. What if you could extend f to be a functor on all one-dimensional manifolds? Then you would get an invariant of the circle. Wonderful. Um, of course, you can tell that one manifolds aren't that interesting, but we'll later be extending this to higher dimensional manifolds. Okay. Uh, let me give one more motivation for homotopy. So great. So if we can extend this to be a functor out of manifolds, that's great. One thing that I want to note is well, the space of embeddings, or the collection of embeddings from a circle to itself, is interesting. In case you haven't done this exercise, if whenever you have a smooth map that's an embedding between compact manifolds, if, if they're connected, it's always a diffeomorphism. So this is just a space of diffeomorphisms of the circle to itself. Okay? And as you might know, the space of diffeomorphisms of the circle to itself is actually quite interesting. It's the circle. Um, a very rare fact. It's definitely not true for all Lie groups, but for this Lie group, it happens to be true. And so, one thing that might be interesting about being able to extend a functor to this category is that you could actually see the topology of this space, at least up to homotopy form. Why might such a thing be interesting? Well, then, whatever you assign to the circle now has an action of this diffeomorphism. And I guess, you know, we're going to a representation theory conference next week. It might be interesting to produce things with circle actions. Okay. In fact, So they inherits uh, diffeomorphism of S1, which I asserted was homotopy to S1 action. Oh, thank you. Okay, so whatever we do, uh, not only might we want invariants of other manifolds, we might want to see an invariant that actually sees the topology of magnetic. That's exactly what we're going to do now. So now let me just give a better definition of this one, which is I don't change any of the boards, but this I consider, the set of embeddings I consider as a topological space. Okay. And you can easily verify that composition of embeddings is a continuous operation on the space of embeddings. So one way you can just think about this one oriented is it's a category but it's enriched over topological spaces. The morphism sets aren't just sets, they have a topology. Okay. So now, uh, what kind of category should we map into to be able to respect this topology? One confusing point is, if you think about vector spaces, say, over the real line, you might think that the set of homomorphisms between them has a topology. You know, because the set of homomorphisms, the vector space over R, has to consider a topology on it. That's not the kind of topology that I want to see on the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, I'm going to demand that my morphism sets are just sets. They're discrete. Okay, does everybody understand that? And that's the reason that, in fact, this condition that isotopic embeddings are sent to the same map actually just follows as a property of having a continuous functor continued here. Okay. So let me now use the word continuous. I'm going to put it in quotes because the word continuous has a different meaning in category here. Well, let's not look at continuous functors from disks into vector spaces, which only have discrete morphisms where you can't see any topology. Now let's look at the category of chain complexes over some base field. And in case you haven't seen this before, the category of chain complexes, uh, if you look at the set of morphisms between any two, you can turn that into a topological. So that's the topology that I'll be using here. Okay. So now, let me give a definition. 
Let me show you. Uh, this one oriented algebra in chain complexes over K with the usual tensor product is the following. It's a symmetric monoidal function. Infinity categories. So, in this lecture, I probably won't get to the definition of infinity categories. There are many out there, but the intuition somehow follows from everything that I've explained before. The left hand side has a morphism space for any pair of objects, the right hand side does too, and all this map to somehow respect this topology. Okay? So in particular, topology on the same yeah, it's a great yeah. question. Let me just leave it as a remark. It's uh, a remark. Let's fix our capital B and capital C to chain complexes. Okay. Let's consider the chain complex from BC. And this gives rise to a topological space. Okay, so by definition, um, a vertex, this is going to be a topological space that's constructed purely combinatorially. We'll define it using vertices, edges, triangles, etc. So a vertex is a chain map. Let's say our F from capital B. But so far, I see some marshmallows. I'm going to put in some toothpicks. Uh, an edge is <coughs> a cohomologically degree minus one map, capital F. So I just say uh, a linear map, capital F from B to C with a degree shift, uh, together with the data. Of two marshmallows, of two chain maps, F0 and F1, from B to C, the ordering 0 and 1 matter, such that F exhibits a homotopy between these parts. Okay. So note that an edge is not remembering that F0 and F1 are abstractly homotopic, it's the data of the homotopy between them. Uh, and so a triangle I might not be able to do off the top of the head, but a triangle. Can I just ask? Yeah. So when you say chain, I mean they, it goes down or it goes up? Ah, so I'm using the no chain complexes. The arrows go. Like yeah. So it's cool. I'm using. Yeah. So I'm agnostic about B and C, whether they're top or bottom. But this I consider the cochain complex. So actually, so let's, let's just that say everything is a cochain. So that means complex. that arrows go up. The degree goes up. Yeah. The differential is a plus one map. And then the shift minus one means goes down. Exactly. So now when I apply D to this, I'll get a map to C zero for this C. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So a linear map like this is the same thing as a degree minus one map from B to C. Okay. So I'm assuming that you've seen the definition of a chain homotopy before. Okay, so what's a triangle? A triangle is the data of, okay, so I and then B to C would be good. So let me draw the picture. Here's B, here's C, here's C. So there's a degenerate edge called the zero homotopy from the identity of C to itself. And then I could have two maps called F and F. Um, oh, actually, I'm giving the wrong definition. I apologize. F not the vertices, the marshmallows are the FIs. And I'll have a bunch of homotopies called F01, F02, and F20. And I'm going to have a single thing called capital H. Let me see if I can do this at the top of my head. H is a map from B to C, shifting degree by 2, so it's a degree negative 2 map, such that our GH minus HD 
It's some linear combination of these FIJs, possibly with another condition. You get the idea. So maybe one thing that you haven't seen before about chain complexes is you can ask more than whether or not two chain maps are homotopic. You can ask whether those homotopies themselves admit a higher homotopy. And that's precisely what this definition is trying to capture. Don't hold my, don't hold me to this exact definition. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. That's a Homotopy capital FIJ on the right probably, right? Oh, yeah, you're right. Actually, let me. No, I mean, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, there might also be some mixture of lowercase f's as well. Okay. Okay. Let me just say something. Yeah, and if you want to write it out, go for it. <laughs> exactly. Cool. So what I want you to notice is uh, I started defining some topological space by giving it vertices and edges. But you can imagine that somebody else in the universe has a much more clever definition of this topological space than I do. The key kind of property that this topological space is going to have is that uh, the cohomology groups of this are going to be the homotopy groups of this. Okay? Um, so let me make it another remark. The space is if you want to look it up, the gold con space associated to the chain complex home. Okay. And it has the following property. If I look at the homotopy groups of this gold con space, it turns out to be naturally isomorphic to the opposite cohomology groups of the home cochain complex, just for i greater than equal to zero. Okay. So this is not just some like random topological space that you cook up. It sees the negative x groups between any two chain complexes. In case you haven't seen it, of course, the cohomology groups of the home complex are usually what's referred to as the s-groups. Um, and so this only sees the negative s-groups, which might be dissatisfying. That's another story. OK. Uh, and the point that I wanted to make was if somebody else, say in this room or elsewhere, gives you some other topological space that satisfies this property, then any two models hopefully will naturally be weakly homotopy equivalent. Somebody gives you some other topological space satisfying this property, they better as heck give you a map relating our space to theirs, exhibiting this isomorphism naturally. <coughs> so this space is well defined uh, up to some naturality conditions we can apply. And now, maybe it's clear what I mean by this. Can you spell it out anyway? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So I e. So first, notice that symmetric monoidalness. And do you mean continuous there? Yeah, so when I say it's a functor of infinity categories, ah, yeah. These are all awesome questions because these are things that are uh, being vague about. Yeah, so when I say a functor of infinity categories, I mean, i.e., respecting home as spaces. And so in this lecture, you can think of it as just being continuous on home spaces. So if I haven't said it explicitly, an infinity category for now you can think of it as just a category of over spaces. The functors between them in particular should respect the space structure. Um, obviously for the experts, you know that there's something disingenuous going on, but that's not, I'm a one step at a time kind of person. Okay, so is it roughly clear what I mean? Because I can spell out what this means now. Just be a little more clear. Okay. So let's give some examples of this. What this gives rise to. The number one thing that I want to specify, and the one thing that I've left up on the board, is that isotopic embeddings are no longer sent to the same map. They're now sent to homotopic maps. So for instance, um, let me continue this example. 
Let's say that I have some isotope here. And I'll go capital I from a particular embedding to the identity embedding. So just imagine some movie of this interval embedded like wiggling out all the way to infinity until it becomes the identity. Okay. If I have some isotopy from uh, this embedding J to the identity of the real line, what will my functor F do to this? Well, there's some vector space called, or chain complex called <coughs> A that I associate to the real line. And now my functor does assign two maps that might genuinely be different. And what the data of this isotopy does is it gives a chain homotopy graph of the isotope I. It gives a chain homotopy between these two maps. Of course, by definition of functor, identities should be assigned to identities. So the identity embedding is honestly so it should be identity map from a chain complex to itself. Okay. okay. And just to do another example. Oh, let's do this up here. Okay. So recall that earlier we saw that this diagram of embedding, so this is the associativity diagram, only commuted up to isotopes. So let's specify whatever isotope you want. There's infinitely many of them. And each of these is actually going to get sent to a homotopy. What this shows is that this multiplication is not associative on the nose, but it's associative up to this specified homotopy. So I want to apply this multiplication map called n. I can do it in two different orders. Um, I'm sorry, this is the unit map. I can do the multiplication map in two different orders for three elements, and the result's going to be the same up to homotopy. So for instance, the effect on cohomology is the same. Should I clarify this point at all? Because I'm happy to. Yeah? I mean, maybe even earlier is the fact that there's not even a single multiplication anymore. That's right. So one thing to note is that uh, every single one of these embeddings that I called JM earlier, is sent to a particular linear map from A tensor A to AF. There's a multiplication now for every J. But one thing again to note is that any two embeddings with this order are going to be isotopic. So up to isotopy, you can in fact consider this to be a single multiplication. Uh, so now let me just say this explicitly. So you might be worried now about the space of embeddings having all kinds of data. Right? Like this seems like an intractable amount of data to ever specify. Whoever wants to write down a multiplication for every embedding of the real line? Well, I hinted earlier how I only wanted to think of these spaces up to homotopy equivalent. And the one thing that saves us is that the space of embedding from, say, the real line to itself is actually contractible. If I have a space of increasing functions from the real line to itself, there's always a contraction to just the identity function. And likewise, the space of multiplications with this order preserved is again contractible. If somebody gives you an entire collection of, say, spheres of embeddings that look like this, there's always a disk that contracts those spheres. So in fact, to a homotopy theorist, even though this looks like a lot of set theoretic data, as a topologist, it's just specifying one map of the contractible choice. It's actually not too much data. Uh, and let me now just state the theorem. Okay, so now let's say that we do have a symmetric monoidal functor of infinity categories like this. What is this? The theorem, the data of such an F is the same thing as a unit of A infinity algebra. Okay. Um, and so, what is an A infinity algebra? Roughly speaking, it's just a chain complex of five of the multiplication associative of the specified homotopy. Okay. So. If all of this infinity categorical higher homotopy stuff was kind of confusing or perplexing, um, again, I wasn't planning on going all into it today, but we'll talk a little bit more about this. Again, the main example to keep in mind is when this was just vector spaces. When a disk one algebra is the same thing as an associated algebra. 
And this is just a wiggly version of that. So can I, so when you say infinity <coughs> algebra, it means it has only one multiplication? That's right. Or it has many? So it has one multiplication and it's yes, associative it's, it's up to one, one multiplication. And it's associative up to one, uh, you know, higher one. One specified homotopy that coheres the associativity condition. Right, and not infinitely many, but you need you need one. Uh, there's infinitely many in the sense that now when you multiply four elements, the way that you parenthesize them might matter, but you want to specify a homotopy showing that the way you parenthesize doesn't matter. And, and this continues at all levels? Or? That's right, it's at all levels. Um, this continues you know, at all levels, but at every, le every level you list the finitely many things. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Maybe also the question is what is the same thing? Oh yeah, sure. So I mean, they're just an equivalent of categories. An equivalent of infinity category. In the category of algebras. The category of A infinity algebra. <coughs> so this is the thing that on objects takes capital F to F of the real line, which we considered, which we denoted as A before. I haven't exactly told you what to do with all the data of all the spaces of multiplication, but again, up to contractible choice, there's only one multiplication. That's one way you can think about this theorem. There's all this confusing data that we talked about for discrete algebras. There's a compact way to write it out in a specific way. Okay. Um, but I really do recommend that if this is the first time seeing this, you shouldn't think of this in terms of like a set of embeddings together with continuity. Once somebody tells you it's contractible, you should imagine it's just one multiplication anyway. Up to homotopy, Rn is just a point. Anything contractible is just a point. But what I don't understand is if you say it's just one multiplication, why not say it is also just associated on the node? Well, it's a great question. Because, for instance, if we demanded that things were just associated on the nodes and we didn't see the higher homotopies, the circle that we want to see acting won't appear. Let me get to that next. Is that there? Great question. So I promise there's a payoff to all this. Okay, cool. All right, so now let's go back to the question. Uh, the circle. Okay. So let's say that we do want to define an invariant for the circle. Um, what kind? What should the invariant of S1 look like. So in the example of ordinary vector spaces over a base field K, we want so there's the collection of all oriented one manifolds inside of which a circle is an object. And we want to extend a functor like this. So we have our original functor f, and we want this extension. Okay. So what might such an extension look like? Well, because this is a category of oriented one manifolds with embeddings, whatever invariant we assign should respect somehow the ways in which intervals can embed into this. Invariant of circle with respect embeddings of R which shows many times. So for example, if you have my oriented one manifold called the circle, here's an oriented one manifold called the real line, there's always some embedding of the real line into the circle. And in particular, let me just call this extension again F. We should have a map from F of the real line. That's the circle. So whatever vector space I assign to it, it's some vector space that receives a map from A. Good enough. But I want to notice, let's say that I embed two intervals like so. 
One thing that I want to note is that this embedding of two intervals into a circle clearly factors through a single embedding of a connected real line. So this J2 will factor through some multiplication in the J2. But there's something pretty interesting that goes on here. So now let me choose some elements. And let me call these x1 and x2. Pictorially, you can imagine that to every interval, I just choose some marked point with an x1 on it. It's a marked point labeled by an element of my algebra. OK. I want to note the following, which is that this embedding, which I've drawn as though 1 is preferred over 2, is actually an isotopic this embedding where I first look like I embed 2. And I can factor this embedding to the same bracket. Okay. So i.e., whatever this map is, let me call this f of j, if I apply f of j to x1 times x2, remember this mem is the multiplication map, has to equal f of j applied to x2 times x1. So it's something that looks like it wants to symmetrize the multiplication of ml. And in fact, um, so this is the kind of thing that we should see. So here's a guess. There's just a way <coughs> to extend f all manifolds, such that whatever I apply to the circle should be the canonical thing that receives a map from A and makes its own. This is as a vector space. So before you talk about sigma and your swap map, yes. are you going to cast it in that language here, or is it totally something different going on with your language? Yes, exactly. Uh, this is exactly the sigma map applied to this embedding. Yeah. So I could have done sigma first and then multiplied and then embedded. That's the x2, x1. I'm using that here. Thank you. Okay. And so uh, let me just give an exercise. There's actually a fun other way to write this, which is that you can actually consider A. Everybody knows that any ring is a module over itself. It's both a left and a right module over itself. Okay. And a perverse way to say that is, given any algebra A, I can look at its opposite algebra, which is the same underlying vector space of multiplication or reverse order. The perverse way to say that A is a bimodule over itself is that it's actually a right module over A times A up. Similarly, any vector space A that's an algebra is a right module or left module over A times A up, so I can tensor them together. So the important exercise is to see this equivalence. Okay. All right, so now let me stop fantasizing about what such an extension would look like and just define one for you. And this is the definition of factorization homology. It's a completely opaque definition. That's why I went with exercise and examples here. The definition, it's fixed. I just get one oriented. This one oriented algebra. And that's again a filter called capital S to chain complexes to the usual tensor product of the thing. And if you like, if you don't like this chain complex discussion, you have freedom to choose which target category you like. It turns out that there's a factorization algebra for any target category. There's the category of all oriented one manifolds that disks into the sum. Definition. Um, factorization homology. And I'll define this in just a second. Is the left con extension. Of capital F. Along the canonical inclusion of all disks into manifolds, so the inclusion of categories. Okay, and it's denoted a 
as an integral sign with a, where a here is the algebra that we get by applying this to the rule. Okay. So just as an example, uh, here's how we denote the invariant that we associate to a circle. So now by integrating a over a circle, there's the invariant associated The bottom of the integral is very important to that. Okay, so uh, this definition is completely opaque in the sense that most people don't know what a left con extension is. So rather than telling you the definition of left con extension, which I can if you want, let me give you the one thing that makes this maybe remotely computable. Yeah. Is that. Um, Factorization homology satisfies a property called tensor excision. So this is actually a local to global property. You might recall that the word excision was a synonym for the media torus sequence in your first algebraic topology class. And so tensor excision is meant to connote that this actually sees the monoidal structure in a meaningful way. So let me give you an example because this is pretty awesome. What do I mean by this? So we'll make a remark. Um, let's consider so this is just a copy of the real line, but it begs it like a horse. And uh, let me equip it with an embedding of what I'll call point times R joint of point. It's your union or point disjoint point times R. Okay. I'm just coloring the boundary of this little horseshoe. Okay. Um, this gives a bimodule structure. This gives a module structure on whatever f assigns this real line. Okay. And what is the bimodule structure? The bimodule structure over f of point disjoint point times r. Of course, this is just r disjoint r, but I'm writing it pedantically for future applications. Okay. The point to recall here is that so a tensor a is naturally an algebra, but these things are oriented. Okay. And you can check that uh, when I try to write out a multiplication of things that look like this, it corresponds to embedding them like so. The multiplication that's induced on this top disjoint union is the usual multiplication as we've defined. This is just J sub n. The bottom multiplication that we wrote out here is actually in the opposite orientation. And you can check this is just the effect of applying the salt back and forth. So this is the opposite multiplication. So in fact, this as an algebra, as a vector space, because we have a symmetric monoidal function, it's a this a tensor a. And remember, as an algebra, it's a tensor with a r. Likewise, if we have not a horseshoe, but say a co horseshoe equipped with an embedding of two real lines along the collar, this is a module over A tensor A up as well. So let me say exactly what this module structure is. So we're again going to continue this theme of geometry exhibiting module structure in algebra. Of them. So I can take this horseshoe and I can just squeeze it a little bit into itself. And then I can embed these two intervals like so. Okay. So this in the category of just disks is a map. Right? It's an open embedding, so it's a map in that category. And so if I have a functor, 
where does f send this? f sends this to f of this disjoint union variable tensor f of the horseshoe mapping to f of the horseshoe. And this is nothing more than exhibiting an algebra A as a module over A tensor A up in the usual algebraic sense. I just wanted to assert this as visible at the level of thinking of a one manifold as a horseshoe. Okay. That's right, yeah. So this is the A tensor A up action on A. Here's A tensor A up. Here's A. So in fact, in general, let me just take a few. So in general, suppose we have this is just a Manifold x. It might be a manifold that looks like this, um, with embeddings say, w naught times r. So here w naught is a disjoint union two circle. Any symmetric monoidal functor F in the category of n manifolds with this joint union, to say vector spaces, tensor products, exhibits F of X as a module over F of W naught times R. The thing that I want to note here is that I'm taking the category of n-manifold with open embeddings. If I have a manifold that's a direct product with R, well, every cartoon that I just drew for R and disjoint unions thereof, I can just draw for W0 times R after I projected W0 to the R variable. So by the exact same proof, this actually inherits an associative algebra structure. And these embeddings supply a module structure of this algebra on f of x precisely by the same construction as well. So here's the theorem. Factorization homology. Okay. So, what does it mean to satisfy tensor excision? I.e., mean, if we have a decomposition of a manifold X, in the case that we're interested in, a manifold X in the circle, let's write it as a union of two manifolds glued along some collar. So in our case, we'll have the co-horseshoe and the horseshoe glued along an open submanifold called R disjoint union R. The theorem is that then factorization homology of X with coefficients in A is the only thing that you can do when you have a right module and a left module over a common algebra. It's the invariant associated to X naught tensor with the invariant associated to x1, or where the tensor product is taken, or where the algebra associated to their intersection. Okay. Um, didn't say anything about the lecture in lecture 2 or 3? Yeah, uh, that was lectures 2 and 3. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so, as an example, for example, uh, if capital F is just the data of an ordinary associative algebra over K, then in fact, the integral of the circle of H, the factorization homology of the circle with coefficients in A is, by the theorem, equal to this tensor product that we discovered before. Okay. And if um, F is now an A infinity algebra,
then we roughly get the same answer, but there's one thing that we need to be careful about. So capital A is now an A-infinity algebra here. But uh, early on in your homological algebra education, you're probably taught that naive tensor product of chain complexes doesn't always do the thing that you want. For instance, uh, Tor doesn't behave well. That Tor was constructed so that it behaves well with respect to the following construction, which is you should always state derived tensor products of modules. Okay. And one reason you might want to do this, by the way, is because I'm interested in chain complexes up to quasi-isomorphism. So up to chain maps that induce isomorphism on full modules. And if I want a notion of tensor product that respects that, I need to derive my tensor product. Note that before, um, when I was talking about A infinity algebras, Here I was taking chain complexes over k with tensor over k. Of course, over a field, tensor product is already always derived. Um, here, this is a different tensor product. This is a tensor product over this algebra, which may not, for instance, be flat in any way, or have modules that are flat over it. <coughs> okay. Cool. So now let me, uh, I hyped up all this homotopical thought by saying, hey, the circle action is interesting. This thing is supposed to have a circle action. Let's uh, talk about what the circle action is in a known example. Are there any questions about this application of this theorem? Is the formal statement thereof? Okay. So let's say K be a perfect field. So in positive characteristic, this means that the Frobenius is an isomorphism. Or you can just think that it's a characteristic zero. Okay. And let's let capital A be a commutative smooth finitely generated algebra over K. GM, for instance, punctured line. And it turns out that, so, uh, okay. so in this theorem, the left-hand side is supposed to be the thing that you want to compute, and the right-hand side is supposed to be the thing that you simplify this to. So can we compute this in this setting? And the conclusion, actually, is that this derived tensor product actually has a name. Quasi-isomorphic to the following chain complex, it's the Hochschild chain complex. Okay. So you can take this as a definition. I haven't computed anything yet. The right hand side is just in here, not mapped. So now here's the theorem. It's a theorem called the HKR theorem. Um, so let me take the cohomology then. So the cohomology of this Hochschild complex. is the following by the HKR theorem. Can I just switch on for a second? So yeah. this A now should be viewed as an A infinity algebra? Uh, it's, a, it's a usual commutative algebra, and in particular it's associative. But now you can view it, yes, that's a good point. But now I'm viewing it not in the category of vector spaces, but in the chain complex category. But I mean, how? Uh, how do you do this? You just put it in degree zero? Or yes, yes, exactly, yeah. So A in degree zero. And so there are no homotopies, it's just Everything is just associated. That's right. No. The multiplication, yeah, that's a really good point. The multiplication here is like what you know and love. In A infinity, any associative algebra in the usual sense is an A infinity algebra for trivial reasons. Because multiplication is associative on the node. And you're right, I'm considering this as a chain complex in degree zero. A tensor A naught is still a chain complex in degree zero. But when I take this derived tensor product, because it's derived, some new tensor <coughs> complex appears. So if you like, when I write the you know, the cohomology of this Hochschild complex, I'm just computing the Tor groups of A with itself over A tensor A. Is that correct? Uh, was it epsilon? I'm sorry. No, no, no. Let me state what the theorem is. Um, so this is just actually uh, the, the uh, algebraic Duran form.
is that in degree k, you get the algebraic Duran k form. So for example, in degree 0, we just recover the ring, the 0 forms of this function. And in these examples, in degree 1, we'll just remember all of these with dx1s, dx2s, yada, yada, and so on. So where does the circle action come in? Well, if you like geometry, Duran forms should have a differential. Like Duran forms are just some graded vector space. It's the cohomology of the differential on them that recovers some topological invariant or something. But at this stage, we don't see a differential. So the differential in this case is going to be some degree one operator. And my claim is that degree one is precisely the degree one generator of the circle, which is itself diffeomorphic. So to see this degree one operator acting on the Duran co-chain complex, to see to make it a co-chain complex, you really use the functoriality of factorization homology, the continuous function. Okay, uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. If there's any short questions, maybe. I don't know if it's short, but uh, how far does the uh, Duran homology test that is getting? Right. I think there's at least two distinct proofs. The hardest part is proving something called a push forward form. Um, let's talk later. So this requires very clear thinking, and that's the difficulty of it. <laughs> okay, well, let's thank Hiro again. So let's take a short five minute break and then. Uh, Yeah. I'm also left-handed, so I'm, uh, I'm not. This, I'm not doing this because I just like. I just. Yeah. And it moves just enough, and then uh, it's
Yeah, so uh, it's slightly technical with any categories. You just need to improve the certain vibration instructions. We have like a composition of a manifold like so. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was exactly. Oh, yeah. That's why I wrote it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, on this, uh, on this thing here, Yes, exactly. So, uh, that's all. Yeah, the other one. Yeah. No, 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 no. On, on this space. I'm yeah. yeah. showing you. Well, uh, I guess this way it's yeah. inverted, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm just thinking of the way it's over here. Yeah. Yeah. That's one. It's it's to do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I write W, most of the time I'm getting in the symmetric group, and I often use the funky S for that, there's so many S's in everything I do, but, you know, I mean, right, rounds of type A, N minus 1, and, right, my favorite present, you know, we mostly think of it as being a coxeter group, right, with these generators, simple reflections, Fi, and we have our relations which we have a quadratic relation and we have braid relations. And of course, if we were in type A, we might have type B relations and so on. Right, so your quadratic relation is that you square each of these and you get the identity. So it's a simple reflection, okay? And um, of course, we model this as just thinking that swapping i and i plus one and we can even draw right, pictures that go with it and i and i plus one and this drawing of picture uh is going to be really helpful to do okay because even we're going to be able to even draw a picture to get us through and understand what's going on with the double f and half algebra hmm. So, um, now of course, if I'm not just talking about the group, if I'm talking about a group algebra, then that lets me actually rewrite this relation 
and stacked in my side, on the floor, on the side of the and being here. And of course, we are not going to talk about the group. We're going to have a, some coefficients that we're going to be talking about over K algebra, over, or F algebra, over some field F. And I'm just going to call it F and not really pin it down, because we're going to need various things for that. Um, and some people even think it's needed in there. But for representation theory, it's really nice to work over field. Um, and so again, I know I've, uh, most people probably know this, but I'm just doing it slowly because then we're going to ramp it up eventually. And then your braid relations, right, are that, well, if transpositions aren't adjacent, they commute. I'm going to just write it. Um, I, the subscript is far apart, and it's not SISKSI. Okay, I'm using a K and an I instead of an I and a J because my I's and J's look a lot alike. And it's S and minus one, and um, you know, within the subscript, you know what they are. Okay. And I prefer to write my braid relations as so. You might see some people would instead write it as S I S K, the M being one, where when K equals I, you let M be one. When K and I are far apart, you let M be 2, and when I and K are close together, you let M be 3. But why did I not write it that way? Well, because you do want to think of, if I write down all the way at the bottom, is this true? Nope, nope. Okay, I want to write down all the way at the bottom. Um, right, I want to think to myself of the symmetric group or the quotient of the braid group. And when you think about the braid group, you don't want to put in a relation like so. You want to put in a relation like so, that a product of elements is a product of elements, not saying that you have something of finite order. Okay. And so the braid group, there's not wide agreement on what we'll call its generator. Today I'm calling them Gs, but I might forget that later on. Uh, and all you have are the braid relations you don't have the quadratic relation at all. Okay. And again, we should, um, so if SI was written here, GI I might write right, like so. That's an, actually an over process. Okay. And then, you know, when you write this, if you do SI twice, Right. If you do SI twice, you just draw in the picture, and you say, oh, well, look, that just pulls apart, because they just, they just cross over. But if you do GI twice, you just get something that's twisted up, like my braid. Okay? And so you can't do anything because it is what it is. Okay. But one thing that's nice, so this braid relation here actually holds in the braid group. So you might think that um, these guys commuting or these guys having this three-term product is something special, but it, it actually happens over here. So if you actually draw it out <coughs> um, with overcrossing, it'll work. Do you want to see it drawn out? Okay, you've just seen that before. Exercise. Draw it out yourself. Okay. Um, and I should say, so the braid group is, you know, it arises in nature, not just by drawing these pictures and seeing that you have these relations. You can get it from topology, right? You can take an appropriate hyperplane arrangement, um, and then, well, if you just start with the naive one and you take pi one the fundamental group, you get the pure braid, braid group. But if you actually say, oh, I have this extra action of a group, you quotient out by that, and you take the fundamental group, then you'll get the braid group. Okay, so. Um, I'm just going to skip writing something down for that, but if people have more questions later. Actually, there's better experts than I in the audience about thinking about the grade group that's coming from uh, I want a fundamental group. Okay. Um, so, and of course, the symmetric group also, using W, right, it occurs as the vial group coming from, say, GLN or FLN. So if you think of them as n by n permutation matrices, um, that's another place um, where it occurs in nature. Okay, and so, all right, so the symmetric group, 
what's important about it is that it acts on various nice spaces. And I'm actually not going to talk um, today, I don't think, about you know all the irreducible representations, young diagrams, young tableau, all of that. I sort of I'm hoping people are familiar with that, but I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to start with some much more basic things that it acts on. Well, okay. So, well, it acts on the set one through n, which I'll write sort of brackets n, well, by commuting them. But it's also nice to stick this n inside of the integers and have it act n periodically. Right, so when I say it acts on one through n, that's saying, oh, I think of this SI as swapping I and N plus one, and writing my picture. Uh, if I'm acting on D peri N periodically, so that means that SI is going to swap, well, okay, yeah, you swap I and I plus one, but you also swap everything um, down the road. And so, um, Right, if we were to draw a picture, so, well, you'd have to sort of have your number line, and you'd have to swap I and N plus one um, repeating over and over again. That gets a bit old. You might want to just write, um, sort of just think of this as one fundamental domain core. It just simply gets repeated over and over again. or you might want to actually just put it yourself on a cylinder and just think it wraps around and then kind of keep track of, you know, what's seen here is one and one plus n and one plus two n and so on. Um, periodic, it's no harm to draw it on a cylinder. Um, and again, that way of thinking of things is going to come back as we move down our ethical. Um, another thing that we want to think of it acting on is Rn, or even, you know, Fm for some field, um, by just commuting coordinates, right? So, um, Si with a swap in the i plus first. <coughs> and I coordinate, and that is a reflection over the hyperplane you know, xi minus fj is zero. Um, all right. So another thing uh, that we might want to do with Sn is look at uh, so-called parabolic subalgebras of it. Um, so if J is some subset of my indices, right, I could write WJ for just the subgroup generated by just those transformations. Okay. And you might also have heard of young subgroup. So I might say the word sub parabolic subgroup or parabolic subalgebra, and I might sometimes, when I have my Conway Forks hat on, I might say young subgroup. And so what's going on? What do I mean? I'll just show you on an example. So let's say n is 7, j is, say, 2, 3, 6. So then, by WJ, I mean, right, you get to sort of, I'll write it this way, um, right? One has to go to itself, but you commute two and three and four. Five has to, yeah, five has to go to itself, but you get to commute six and seven, because that's what your SI do. And so, I could just write that as S1312. Okay, 
And so beta is my composition. One, three, one, two. You know, it's a bunch of numbers that add up to seven. And it's ordered. It doesn't have to be a partition. I don't have to be two, one, one. Okay, so when I write it this way, I think young subgroup. When I write it the other way, I think parabolic. So I think about taking out the certain generators, or then I, I take the group generated by S2, S3, and S6. And you should be able to go back and forth between, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, you've got two and three divides and three there, and the six and seven. And And so, um, why talk about these parabolic subgroups? Well, we're going to, you know, soup it up later. Do you, but do you distinguish one three one two from one one two three? Yes, they are different subgroups, but they're all conjugate to each other, right? So yeah, so that's um, so. Let's notice that S one three one two. It's not the same as S3211 or any reordering. They're not equal, but they are isomorphic. They're conjugate to each other. Okay, and they have conjugates that don't that are not young subgroups. You could conjugate by something weird, and we'll okay, you still get some subgroup. Um, so that was interesting, but when we move to Hecka algebras, we pair. Um, the conjugation in the group is, is a great thing. Um, but in the symmetric group, we have a notion of length. And we care about what the length is. Um, so this is this notation, this yeah. the, that's called the seven. This uh, notation, say again? This notation, I don't know how to pronounce it. Oh, 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 this. Yeah, so this means yeah. partition. It's a composition of. No. Uh, what? Partition, so it's not partition. if I wrote 3, 2, 1, 1, I would use a D. So my notation for is a partition of, so this D dash uh -huh. is a partition of, and this notation is, is a composition of. And the composition is what? Again? It's just? Uh, it's just a... Um, couple of positive numbers that add up to seven. Right. Which is ordered. Yeah. Combinatorial groups might say a weak composition even allows zeros in there. Yeah. Uh, yes, no, please ask when I don't define the annotation. So let me write bold one for the trivial representation, and I'm going to use the bold ones a lot of times when a trivial representation makes sense, and it might not always be the same exact one, but it's always going to be the trivial representation, right? So, the trivial representation, so for instance, and I'm going to use that loosely in whatever context I want. So, for instance, if I write bold one for my parabolic subgroup WJ, what do I mean? I mean the one dimensional representation, let's say, you know, whatever field you're working over F, but span by one vector such that all of your let's say B equals V for all of J and J. So all of your generators are acting. Um, or if you want, that is x to the minus one. So it's a zero vector. Remember this. Okay. And so, well, one reason why we care about parabolic subalgebras is they give us a way of building up representations. As you know, in algebra, right, it's often useful to go to um, go to smaller, easier things deal with them on a smaller, easier level, and then build up bigger things from them. So for instance, something that's going to be important to understand is induce this representation of. And what is that and what do you get? 
So when I say induce, I always am going to mean tensor product. So, oops. Uh, and you know, we can really think today that S is a complex number, but whatever field we're working over. All right, so by induce, I always mean Judith relative tensor product. And, you know, uh, how big is this? How do you think about it? What's the basis? How do you write these things down? These are things that I'm hoping you know, but I'm sort of reminding you of. Okay. So on the one hand, one way we can think about this, right, is just the permutation representation on the left process. If it's a left action, I like left actions. Okay. Um, so this is, right? And so in this example, right, if I said, what's the dimension of it going to be, you're just going to get a multinomial coefficient, 7 factorial over 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial. And I like to put my 1s in there, even though you might think, I don't need to have the 1s. It really is a good placeholder. Sorry, could you yes. say, you, you chose the number 7 and then yes. subset J, yes. and then how do you read off? Ah, how would I read these off? Which is, um, I just think to myself, so I have S2, so I don't have S1, right? I don't have S1, 1 stands alone. I have S2 and S3, and S2 and S3, you know, we're going to swap 2 and 3 and 3 and 4, so I don't put any breaks in there, because I know 2 and 3 will mix these guys all up. I don't have... I don't, yeah, so, so really, so ah, S the breaks are the, the breaks are the missing eyes to the S's, right? So we don't have S1, so I put the bar after S1. We don't have S4, I put the bar after S4. We don't have S5, I put the bar after S5. So these, these bars are the gaps, are the missing SI. And if you think about it, the subgroup <coughs> generated by taking S2, It will allow things that mix up two, three, and four and mix up six and seven. But yeah, combinatorially, the missing eyes are these bars, and then you do the composition by saying how big are each of the connected components. One, three, one, two, three, seven. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Um, yes. So if so, basically, if you wanted a nice basis of this space, so the best basis to take are, well, any coset representatives would do, but the minimal length coset representatives are sort of the best, and as I mentioned, we care about length. So, length. The length, how many people need a review of length? Talks about length, okay. So, let me say, so, so, let's see. So a basis, so people often will put a superscript on super j with the set of minimal length. And you know, maybe the j should be on the left side or the left, but anyhow, left. So it's that representative. So, give, so I said that these si's generated a symmetric group. I just claim that without justifying it. Um, But you know, it makes sense if you have a bubble sorted, you can get any permutation by just doing adjacent adjacent swap. And so the length of a word is the minimal um, number of generators you need to express. So I have a particular permutation. There's some way I can write as a word in the generator, and if L is minimal, then we say L is the length of W. And because, um, because of the way that my braid relations work, that they were homogeneous, 
right? A word of length two is a word of length two, a word of length three is a word of length three. Um, it turns out that any, you know, any two minimal length um, expressions can be gotten to by doing a series of phrases, of doing, you know, swapping things that you can, or changing one, two, ones into two, one, threes, and two, two, twos into three, two, threes, and so on and so forth. You'll actually get a good connected graph. Um, so, so, and it turns out if what you put here is going to be a parabolic subgroup, and you say let's look at a coset of it, there's a unique representative in there of minimal length. So if I say take the minimal length coset, okay, well, there aren't going to be two different coset. There's going to be a unique one in there of minimal length, and it's going to have the property that when you multiply it by anything in the subgroup, the length is always going to go up, and in fact the lengths are always going to be additive. Okay. Is it the same as not involving the J's? No, no, you could think it's the same as not involving the J's, but it's not. So, for example, if we took, um, let's say, not n equals 7, let's take, you know, say n equals 4, and let's say J, let's let J be 2, 3. Uh, yeah, 2, 3. And so then, what are my minimal length coset representatives? So, you know, we've got, um, well, we've got the identity. Certainly you have S1, because S1 isn't in there, but you've also got S2, S1. And you've also got S3, S2, S1. Okay. And then you can check I have them all, because of course, right, four factorial, Remember the you have n minus one generators for S n, and you get n factorial. Um, so certainly, if you write out one of these minimal length coset representatives, and you and you write out a reduced word for it, I call these reduced words. Reduced words, reduced expressions. Whatever transposition sits on the right has to be in the complement of J. But then what precedes it in the prefix, you can see lots of other stuff. And you can check if you multiply by S2 or S3 or any, you know, anything in here, any of the six guys in here, always is gonna make, it's always going to add the, the, the length to it. So if you want, um, there's a nice book by Humphreys on Coxeter, who's the same something something, um, they have a nice, they do it for all types, not just type A, but these kind of Coxeter and nice things that are not special. Um, all right, so right. So this is something, um, the basis of it, understanding that you have the minimal length coset represented, this is going to come back to us again in more complicated situations. Um, so, ah. Induction, adjoint to induction is restriction. Okay, and restriction is easy, right? Induction is complicated, tensor product. Restriction is often easy if you can understand it. But you might not remember what happens when you combine induction and restriction. So let's say you took a representation of a parabolic subgroup WJ. Trivial is easy if you can put any representation up here. You induce it up, okay? It's dimension growth by multinomial coefficient. Then restrict it to some other parabolic and see what you get. Okay. And in fact, um, well, so one way that you can think about it is it's going to be still this permutation representation on the cosets, but now you're restricting the action to just this other parabolic subgroup WK. And the orbits are just going to correspond to double cosets. <coughs> right? 
right? So you might remember when you first learned algebra, and you're like, okay, cosets, I got that, and double cosets. There are double cosets. Double cosets are so weird, they don't have to all be the same size. Like, why do you ever want double cosets? This is why you want double cosets, to tell induction matrix and play with each other. And so, um, we have this Mackey formula, a Mackey decomposition, that you can write restrict induce as a sum of induced restricts. Uh, let me just take my field to be the complexes so I can put a direct sum there. Okay. Although actually maybe since it's a symmetric group, I can get away with any field. Um, you can write the sum of uh, restrict induces. And so what are you restricting to and what are you doing um, your inductions for? Well, in the end, right, this is how I remember it. Um, we're ending up with representations of one subgroup WK, so I must be inducing up to WK. And so you must be going from uh, some subgroup that sits inside there. Well, it's WK intersect with some conjugate of my WJ. And then, well, you're restricting from WJ to a subgroup of WJ. Well, it turns out it's sigma inverse WK sigma intersect WJ. Okay. Well, restrict your trivial, it's still the trivial, it doesn't matter. And you're like, wait a minute, I restricted to a different subgroup that I'm inducing up from. Well, you use the sigma to twist it. And where does sigma come from? Sigma r, your minimal length co 